We're in a series right now called A Wonderful Life. Who loves the wonderful life? Yeah. All right, if your hand's not up, I need to talk to you. Who loves a wonderful life? All right, we all want a wonderful life. I tell you, it's all perspective, and you got to have the right attitude. Uh, Sarah had sent a video to the Sturmer group, and this video was uh, uh, my granddaughter. She was getting ready for school, and they got like this theme song. They, they sing Getting Ready for School, and I said, now that's how we all are to feel about this wonderful life, and it was so cute. I just wanted you to see it, so check this out. <laughs> Y'all give her a hand clap. Isn't that great? <laughs> now, who in here sings just like that? Y'all notice, you know, when you don't know the words, you're just like, eh, yeah, yeah. And then you, then, you, then you get the words and you're like, you know, you just, I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed. And then you're like, no, 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 no. But I'm a child of God. You know, that's, who sings like that? That's me. I do the same thing, so. I love it. Uh, but man, uh, that's, the, that's the attitude we have to have. Who's blessed in here? Come on, who's blessed? And, and, and having a wonderful life is truly about being blessed. I want you to see the definition. And this is, this is kind of what we've been talking about all the way right before Thanksgiving. You pull it up, please. Right before Thanksgiving, uh, and then last week, and then this week. But a wonderful life is a life of blessing. So God wants to bless us, but let me know he didn't want to just bless us so we can wallow in it. He wants us, he wants to be blessed so we can enjoy it, yes, but he also wants to bless us so that we can have purpose, so that we can be a blessing in other people's lives. Like you saw, because collectively we've gotten together as a church and we give to the Lord you see all the things around here that we're able to do, like you're checking out the widows, you're seeing what's going on, all of that. You know, it takes resources to be able to do that and time and energy. And, and, and we collectively are able to do that because we're blessed and because we have purpose. But not just blessed and purpose, but last week we talked about it also comes with sacrifice. Can I get an amen? amen. And I know a lot of people run from sacrifice in the life that we live because we're addicted to comfort, but you're not going to serve Jesus and not sacrifice. And we talked about, you know, it's, it's when it's not I that live, but it's Christ that lives in me. And we talked about being that living sacrifice on the altar of God. And we got to bind ourselves to that so we can't wiggle off because we tend to want to wiggle off. We need to be bound to the altar of God. And, and then when you do those things, you're going to have fulfillment on the inside. So you're blessed, you're enjoying it, you're being a blessing, you have purpose, you're sacrificing yourself. It's not you that live, that Christ but lives within you. And I'm telling you, when you are living in that way, you're going to be fulfilled. And that's what's called the what? Wonderful life. Let's try that again. That's what's called the what? Wonderful life. Amen. So the title of the, today's message is a wonderful life. But to have a wonderful life, we need to make sure that we are staying on plan A. How you know plan A is God's will for our life? So to stay on plan A, we have to make sure there's no plan B. <laughs> and I mean no plan B in the drugstores either. Can I get an amen? So no, no plan B. We don't want to have plan B. 
And so, because when we follow God, uh, God didn't have plan B. He's a plan A God. I mean, think about Yahweh, our Father. He didn't have a plan B when he sent Jesus Christ. Come on, he had one son. He didn't say, well, I'll send him. If he don't work, I'll get another one. I mean, no, that was it. Jesus Christ, that's plan A. There ain't no plan B. How many know Jesus Christ didn't have a plan B either when it came to saving the world? Actually, there was a plan B, but it wouldn't save the world, so it really wasn't the right plan. That was when he was in the garden, and he asked Father, hey, I know this is plan A, but is there a plan B? And the Father said, uh, nope. I mean, you can call the angels, but that didn't save the world. The only way the world's going to be saved is if you follow plan A. Guys, can I tell you something? The only way you can fulfill God's purpose in your life is if we follow plan A. Yeah, and then we don't yield to plan B. Right there you see that it's easy to jump on to plan B if we're not careful. So we've got to be focused so we stay on plan A. And look, Elohim did not have a plan B when it came to getting the gospel across all of creation. Elohim meaning the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Listen, the only way God can get the gospel out is if you and I do it. And so there isn't like, well, if they don't do it, I'll have to get someone else to do it. No, we, that's it. We're plan A. And there is no other plan. And so if we don't do it, it doesn't get done. But we must get rid of plan B so that we can live plan A. What is plan A? The wonderful life so that we are blessed, so that we have purpose. And yes, that means we're also going to sacrifice, but that's where we get so much fulfillment. How many know when it doesn't cost you anything, it doesn't mean anything? But when it costs something, it means more. And so we have to realize this. So today what I want to do is I want to give you four ways to live in plan A. Who wants those four ways to live in plan A? So we're going to look at four ways we can stay in plan A and not go to plan B. The first thing is we have to realize you are not going to understand everything. Listen, on this walk with the Lord, he just don't explain all of it. I mean, think about the Bible in itself. The Bible is, I mean, it's, it's this big, depending on, you know, if you, you know, like uh, some people that might be in the room, it's a little bigger because you got to get them large letters, right? But <laughs> some of y'all get that, that thin line, right? And uh, I mean, you could get as small as this little thing right here and get some, you know, magnifying glass and look at it. Unless you're young and then you can, you can do a little, and it's the whole thing right there. And so what do you don't have a lot? You don't have a lot of all the details explained. And so God's, you know, not a God that's going to give you everything. I mean, how about the disciples? He just said, go on the other side. That's it. Go on the other side. You think he could have said, hey, uh, while you're going on the other side, there's going to be a storm that's going to be coming up. But I want you to know, I'm going to give you, you know, the details. Uh, you're going to make it because I'm going to be walking across and you're going to see me and then you're going to call me over and everything's going to be okay. But how do you know God doesn't give you the details like that? And so sometimes you're just not going to understand. And you just have to trust and do it anyway. So you got to realize you're not going to understand everything in life. But I mean, which one of you in this room has ever understood everything that happened in your life? Matter of fact, David was like, hey, uh, these things are too hard for me, so I'm not even going to worry about them. I'm going to go in the house of God, and I'm going to worship. And I know that I trust him, and that's good enough for me. Well, I want to go into this story in John 6, 60. And before I read that scripture to you, uh, you can pull it up. Before I read that scripture to you, this is where the disciples uh, Jesus had spoke to them and he said, I want you to eat my body and to drink my blood. If you don't eat my body, you don't drink my blood, you have no part with me. Well, I, I, we're going to kind of walk through this story a little bit because following that statement, it said many of his disciples said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? Hmm. 
He said, this is very hard to understand. Let me tell you something. You're going to face things in life that are very hard to understand. And the person that thinks, I've got to figure it all out before I'm going to do it, will never follow God. You're going to jump on a different plan. And it's not going to be plan A. You're going to jump on plan B. Because you're never going to have it all figured out. And sometimes it's hard, but you still have to do it. And how about Abraham? I want to show you an example of that. I mean, Abraham, when God called him in Genesis 13, and he said, uh, hey, Abraham, I just want you to leave everything you got and just start walking. That's it. He said, I'll bless you. You're going to be a great nation, make a great name of you. You can be blessed, so you can be a blessing. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, but that was kind of it. I mean, we live in a world where, you know, if we're going to get a surgery, okay, uh, when is it going to happen? Uh, how long am I going to be down for? What's the risk? See, we want all the details before we make a decision to, to step out in something. And, and let me just say this. You won't follow God. I gave up long ago trying to figure out details. Probably drives my team crazy. I'm like, hey, we're going to do this. Said, what about details? Said, hey, it'll all work out. <laughs> That's why I call it pan-trib. You know, some people are pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. And they actually, what are you? I said, I'm pan-trib. They said, what's pan-trib? I said, it all pans out. <laughs> Just keep serving Jesus. It all pans out. It's going to work out. And so, but you're not going to have all the details. I'm sure Abraham was kind of tripping out uh, a little bit when, after he waited to, he was 100 years old to have Isaac, and then 30 years went by of him spending time with him, that the Lord came and said, hey, now you're going to sacrifice him to me. I mean, you don't don't think in his mind some things were going on? Whoa, 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 whoa. Explain this to me a little bit. No, no explanation. You're not going to understand what I'm doing. I'm not going to tell you what I'm doing. You just got to do it. And what's interesting is when you obey God, even when you don't understand, that's when the Lord told Abraham, now I know that you honor and respect me above everything. Because you went against everything that you felt to do what I told you to do. Wow. It's pretty incredible. Look, you're not going to be given all the details on this journey of a wonderful life. And if you, you're one that says, I need all the details, I need to understand it all before I do it all, then you're not going to do it all. You're going to end up jumping off ship, and you're going to jump on plan B instead of staying on plan A. I just want to encourage you guys, that, that and I wanna, I'll also want to uh, warn you, that the, the further you walk with God, there are many times the Lord has spoke to me to do things that made no sense to me. But I do them anyway, and I tell you what, uh, all things work out to the good of those who love God and called according to his purpose. And you just got to trust him, and you just got to obey him if you're going to stay on plan A. All right, the next thing about staying on plan A, number two, is we got to stop blaming and complaining. We have to stop blaming and complaining because it's interesting in this story, uh, they were like, hey, wait a minute, this is hard to understand. And as soon as it got hard to understand, they started pointing fingers. I want you to see this, John 6, 61. Jesus was aware his disciples were complaining and he said to them, does this offend you? So they they were like, ah, man, I don't know. This is hard, Jesus. So they're pointing fingers at Jesus and they're complaining about what he asked them to do. I wonder how many times we do that in our life, where we start pointing fingers and complaining about what's going on here. And, and we, we can't do that. we got to learn not to do that. It's like the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. What did they do when they're in the wilderness? They started uh, uh, grumbling and they started complaining. They were pointing their fingers at the leadership. And they're like, man, where are you bringing us? And this ain't what we signed up for. And it should be different than this. 
And so they're, they're complaining, they're pointing fingers. And what did God do to them, Cindy? He sent snakes. That's what Cindy told the kids before <laughs> when they were little. They're little and they're complaining. Cindy said, you know what God did to people that complained in the Bible? He sent snakes to bite them. <laughs> How do you know? They quit complaining. <laughs> they start complaining. I just, I just get behind the door and go, But he said, hey, one thing God does not like is grumbling, complaining, and pointing fingers. He, he doesn't like that at all, okay? And so we, we can't be complainers and blamers because here's what happens when you do that. Blaming and complaining can be preludes to bailing to plan B. Matter of fact, it is a prelude to bailing to plan B. When, when Moses is on the mountain, they're complaining. He's been gone too long. Where, where is he at? What's going on? And you know what? They started complaining, and, and they totally abandoned what God had for them in that moment. And they grabbed jewelry off themselves, and they built a what? A golden calf. They built a golden calf. So when you grumble and complain, you're on your way to walking away from the plan of God. When you're pointing fingers and you're complaining, you got to be careful because that's when you can end up in a bad place. You can end up going in the wrong direction. Instead of blaming and complaining, how about getting to work to make things better and allowing God to work inside of you. You know, come on, you've been at work and the boss, uh, they'll give a job to do for everyone, you know, who's a part of that to, to go and do it. And it's something that's not, you're not crazy about doing, but there always is one, come on somebody, that they just sit around and they're like, oh man, I can't believe he or she asked me to do this. And I don't want to be here. I don't like doing this. And pointing their finger and blaming. How many you know that just makes the whole day bad? Instead of, instead of blaming and complaining, how about just going, hey man, could you just keep your mouth shut and let's just get to work? Because if, if we get to work, we'll get this thing done. Or, or you know what happens is when you, when you realize that there is no plan B, you'll make plan A nice. See, when people got a when people have a plan B, they're, they're like, in their back of their mind, okay, if I don't like this, I'll just jump over. If I don't like this, I, I, I'll, just, I'll just go over there. I'll just, I just jump off this thing. And, and, and let me tell you something. That's, that's, you got to be careful because when there is no plan B, you're going to make plan A livable. That means in marriage. That means in church. That means whatever God has you doing, you're going to make it work, and you're going to make it livable. And so the other thing is, not only do the work to make it livable, to make it better, but allow God to do His work inside of us. A lot of times we get ourselves uh, where we're going through something, and instead of going, okay, what is God doing in me? What is he trying to work out in me or maybe work out out of me? We begin to murmur and complain and point to God, saying, what are you doing? Instead, we are to be saying, okay, what is God doing? Yeah, that's a good statement. What is God doing in me? Not as what is God doing to me? What is God doing in me? Because the Bible even says, we're going to face tough times. We're going to face difficult times, things that we don't understand well. And he said, but that's the very times that God is trying to shape something in you that's special. That's the times that he wants to strengthen your faith like never before. But we have to, we have to go through those times not murmuring and complaining and blaming. We have to go through those, come on, with the heart of little Mariah. You know, I'm blessed, yes, I'm blessed. <laughs> Doesn't it say rejoice? Even when you're in hard times? 
Y'all need to learn how to play the glad game. Who knows what I'm talking about when I say the glad game? Wow. Wow. The rest of you don't know the glad game? Have y'all never seen the movie Pollyanna? Did I say that right? Pollyanna? Pollyanna was famous for the glad game. No matter what was going on, she looked for something positive to be going on instead of looking to the negative. And it changed her whole atmosphere, and it changed the whole town. That's a classic. You might want to go watch that. And so, but we got to quit murmuring, complaining, and blaming. Because that's what we like to do. It's their fault. It's his fault. It's her fault. It's the circumstance fault. It's the culture's fault. In in other words, we get in this whole victim mentality. God did not call you to be a victim. He called you to be a victor. And you you don't become a victor by murmuring, complaining, and blaming. You become a victor by working the problem. That's how you become a victor. By working the problem, by making it better, and and by allowing whatever God's trying to do in you to let it be done so it will change who you are, so that we can be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the fourth uh, way that we can live plan A, or the third, excuse me, the third way we can live plan A is, thank you all for keeping me on my toes, someone's taking notes, I love it is we have to burn the bridges behind you. Now, we're told all the time, don't burn your bridges. Why? In case I want to go back and cross them. Ooh, wow, the Holy Spirit just showed me this. That's why he took them across the Red Sea. Because he said, whoop, I'm going to let you cross, and then I'm going to what? I'm going to close it up because I don't want you crossing back over there. Whoa! Wow, that was the Holy Ghost right there. Let me, let me tell you something, guys. There, look, yes, look, sure, there's some bridges that are, are, are godly that you don't burn, but there are a lot of bridges that aren't godly and should be burned. And, and we need to, because as long as that bridge is there, you're going to be tempted when things get hard, when things get difficult, when you don't understand, you're going to be tempted to go across that thing. Listen, I, the story of Elijah and Elisha. Man, what a beautiful story here. Elijah, God had sent him to put his mantle on Elisha. And so when he, when he found Elisha, Elisha was plowing in a field with his ox and his plow. And he walked up to him. Elijah walked up to Elisha and threw his mantle on him and started walking away. And he knew what that meant. Elisha knew what that meant, that Elijah was calling him to be his disciple, to follow him, just like Jesus would call the disciples. And so, but, so he ran to Elijah, and he said, Elijah, if you don't mind, let me go back and tell my mom and dad bye. And Elijah looked at Elisha and said, do you really understand what I just did to you? Do you really understand what I just did to you? And Elisha was like, oh, it doesn't mean I don't want to go. And he ran back, and his ox that he had that he was plowing with, he killed them. He took the the plow that he had, and he busted it up in pieces, and he made a fire, and he put the ox on the fire, and he cooked them, and he gave it to all the people to show Elijah Listen, no, I understand perfectly what you just did. I understand that I am never going back to this life. And to prove that I understand it, I'm going to burn my bridges behind me. I'm going to kill my livelihood of what I had. I'm going to destroy the plow because, I, hey, I'm with you. And you, you see that, that just uh, zeal that he had because even later on, when Elijah told him, said, stay back, I got to go somewhere, Elijah said, uh-uh, I ain't staying back. Wherever you go, I go. And because he had that tenacity, guess what? He got the double blessing from God to be the prophet of the Lord. And so, you know, I, I, I want you to realize that. 
I want you to understand that. You see, in, because in John 6, 66, it said, at this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted Jesus. So remember, Jesus said, you got to eat my body and drink my blood if you're going to be a part of me. And they said, wait a minute, this is hard to understand. I, don't, I, need, I need a little bit more info. And the Lord didn't give him more info. And he said, does that offend you, by the way? If you're going to serve the Lord, you better get ready to be challenged in a way that will offend you. And you got to get over it. Amen? And so, and then, because of that, they murmured and they complained. And guess what? Because they had other things to go back to, they went back to the... We are so tempted in our lives to go back to things we should never go back to. And so... I want to ask you this question. Is plan B still an option? Because it's still there, or you have dismantled it, broke it to pieces, and killed it? Is plan B, in your, is there a plan B in your life where, okay, if this don't work out, I still have that? You know, one of the things uh, for Cindy and I in our marriage is that there is no D word. And I'm, I'm not talking about the cuss word. I'm talking about divorce. <laughs> There's no D word either. N neither one of those D words. And so there is no D word. We decided when we got married that we made a covenant with God and with each other, and that was it. In other words, if it ain't good, we just have to work to make it better. Because there is no other option. If, if one of us messes up, oh well, we just have to get through it. Because there is no other plan. There is the A plan, to death undo until we part. Can I get an amen? amen. And, and, and this is what I'm talking about. When people have that, have that uh, B plan, and, and they go, well... You know, I'm, I'm not all in, and I see it all the time. I'm not all in in case it don't work out. I still got some stuff over here. You, you failed already because it's going to get hard, and you're going to get in a place where you don't understand it, and you're going to bail. If, if, if it's there, you're going to bail, and you got you to gotta crush it. You got to destroy it. What did Moses do when he came back? I was talking about the, the golden calf. What did Moses do to that golden calf? He said, uh-uh, guys, mm-mm, we're killing that. We're destroying that. We're smashing that. And he smashed it into pieces. we got to decide that those things that are other options, that we ain't taking them. Look, and that means a lot. Look, let me give you, for instance, in Christianity. In Christianity, we're called to do this. Because in Christianity, we're told to crucify our flesh. Why? So we won't do that. We won't go back to that. So that we can live in the spirit and not live in the flesh. And so when you plan A is the only option, I'm going to tell you what, you stay on plan A. But when you have plan B kind of waiting back here, then you're going to go to plan B. Quit going to plan B, guys, and stay on plan A. And then the last one is we have to realize that we have nowhere else to go for this wonderful life. And I don't think people have realized that yet, Russ, that there is no other place. Now, they, they're searching for it all the time. I see Christians all the time in church searching for another way because they, they don't get the results they think they should be getting, uh, mainly because they're, they're not pressing in and or maybe it is something that they're not meant to understand. So they go and they go to a plan B. They start looking for humanism. They start looking for, you know, uh, some other way other than the way that Jesus gave us. Instead of going, no, I only know Christ and him crucified. That's me. Hey, I have made a decision. It's Christ and him crucified. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. And you, that, we have to come to that understanding. Look in this scripture in John 6, 67 through 69. It said, then Jesus turned to the 12 and asked, 
Are you also going to leave? See, many of his disciples walked away. See, the further you go in this thing called the faith walk, the more people jump ship. Because they don't like something, because they don't understand something, because it gets hard, because they still have things that they didn't burn. And when it gets hard and they don't understand, they end up going to it. Instead of realizing, like Peter, Peter replied, because Jesus is interesting. Jesus said, oh, please stay. Come on, will y'all stay? He just looked at him and said, are you going to go too? And I love what Peter said. Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and we know that you're the Holy One of God. You see, when you come to that realization, you don't need no one trying to motivate you every week. Or oh, we need to be reminded, and we need to gather, and we need to worship, we need to do all that. Let me just say this, but that should be just added. Because when you settle this in your heart, there are people in this very room who are listening to me right now that this still isn't settled in your heart. That you think there's got to be something else. Got to be, listen to me. No one else is coming. No one else is coming. Jesus came. And that's it. We have to get to the realization that I believe and I know that he is the son of God. And there is no other place to go but him. I am convinced it's settled. It is written and it is settled in the heavens and on the earth. Is it written and is it settled in your heart? It's settled for me. And let me ask you this. We have to realize in this life that we're not going to understand everything. So we have to stop blaming and complaining we got to burn our bridges behind us if we're going to stay on plan A. See, this is what we got to do to have this wonderful life. Plan B is not better. And you're better off without one. Y'all see that? Let's read that together. One, two, three. Plan B is not better. And you're better off without one. Just get rid of it. You're better off without it. Look, I know the world makes it think that, ah, uh, you know, the grass is greener on the other side. It ain't greener. It's artificial. It's artificial. Listen to me. You can't fall for that. I want to close out with this scripture in Hebrews. Hebrews 10, 35 through 39. It's a very powerful scripture. It said, do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. That's the problem. There are too many of us that don't have confident trust. We may have trust, but it's not confident. And that's why someone can throw you in a whirlwind so easy. You got to have confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Guys, when you have confident trust in the Lord, what is the great reward? The wonderful life that you'll be blessed, that you'll have purpose, that you'll sacrifice everything, but you'll gain everything. Wow. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. And watch, it keeps going. It says, for in just a little while, say just a little while, the coming one will come and not delay. How many know Jesus is coming back, guys? Amen? Amen? I can't tell you when, but I can tell you that he is, and I can tell you that it's soon. Jesus is coming back. That's why I don't get all tripped out about what I see around me. It's prophesied that it's going to get worse. So why are we worried about it getting worse? 
The more I see getting worse, the more I get excited because he's coming back sooner. The worse it gets, the sooner he's coming back. Come on. Wow. So it says, and my righteous ones will live by faith. You know what faith is? <laughs> hey, Joey, Joey. Faith is when you ain't got it all figured out. You just, uh, let, me, let me tell you what faith is, all right? Here you go, Joey, right here. Faith is, is when, when that baby came out of Sarai and then the hospital told you you had to take it home. You done looked at all them videos, you're like, I don't know nothing. But by faith, you just walk it out, right? You walk it out. He said, that's how my righteous one lived. They don't, they don't need the details. Come on, they don't need the details. They don't need it. And if it gets hard, they just know, hey, I'll just work, I'll work it out. Or something will get worked out of me. But it's all right. Because God is sovereign. He's sovereign. By the way, you don't want to miss next week. But watch what he says here. He says, but I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. Matter of fact, the whole book of Hebrews is about this. I'll take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. But I love this. But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. David said in Psalms, he said, I, I hate, I hate those that the works of those. He said, I hate the works of those that turn away. And, and it goes on, it says, but we're not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the what? Faithful ones whose souls will be saved. Let's say that together. Say, we are the faithful ones. Oh, one more time. We are the faithful ones. Wow, stay in your feet, everyone in here. We're not like those that turn away. We're the faithful ones. Come on, say this with me. Say, I am faithful to God. I am faithful to God. Say, well, I stumbled. <laughs> yeah, but the faithful just get back up. They don't quit. They just get back up. We are not those that turn away. We are those that press in. Because there is nowhere else to go. Guys, I, I'm telling you, there is nowhere else to go. There's no one else coming. He's it. And you know what? He is worthy. Oh, I said he is worthy. Come on, I said he is worthy. You know, we've watched this happen, and it's happening more and more. Before COVID, the church was in a downcline, a, a steep downcline already. COVID just went, Phew. I mean, 50% of the churches left. Poof. I mean, just boom, right off. And, and, and even now, worldwide, especially in our country, the decline is continuing. People are going to church less and less. They commit it less and less. And it's, it's still happening. Because they're, they're choosing plan Bs. They don't realize that the end of plan B is not a good ending. The end of plan A, the beginning of plan A, all the way to the end of plan A, is a wonderful life. We have to keep with plan A. So if you, in your heart, you are pondering about a plan B, wipe it out of your mind right now. This is the Lord's love coming to you and going, hey, that ain't an option for you. There ain't but one option, plan A. And that's what I have for you. I want to do something. Bow your head and close your eyes. No one looking around. I believe there are people in this room that never even... They've never been on plan A. They've always lived plan B. 
But today the Lord is, is drawing you. The Holy Spirit is pulling on you to abandon plan B. Even though you don't understand all of plan A. He's calling you to abandon the plan and the, the journey that you're on right now so that you can jump on his plan and his journey, the plan A that he has for your life. If you're in here and that is you, and you know that's you, and God is saying to you right now, right now is the time. Right now is the time to burn the bridges. Right now is the time to make that decision the most wonderful decision that you'll ever make in your entire life. Right now is that time. Maybe you were on plan A and you jumped to plan B and right here today you're like, man, I get it. There is, plan B is artificial. I'm ready to get back on plan A. Whatever the case was, that you want to be on plan A and today you're ready to do that. Right there in your seat. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to pull you up here. I'm not going to put a mic in your face. But you need to take a stance and say, that's me. And I want you to raise your hand right now. Where are you at? Raise it up. Raise it up high. Thank you. Thank you. Raise it up high. Who else said thank you? Thank you. Thank you. Leave it up. Just leave it up. Just leave it up. Because I, you say, I confidently lift my hand. Anyone else said, that's me. That's me. That's me. That's me. Come on, anyone else Say that's me. That's me over there. I got, I got another one in the middle there. I need someone with. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Anyone else said, that's me. Right here in the middle. Yes. Yes, I see you. Anyone else said, that's me. That's me. Right there. Yes, yes, I see that one too. And that one over there. Another one over there. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, what a beautiful thing. We're going to pray right now, church. And we're going to all pray together with these who have their hands up. What a wonderful day this has become. Come on, let's pray this together. All of you with your hands lifted, it says you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God and he rose from the dead and ascended to the Father. You pray this with me and you shall be saved. Say, Father, I give you my life today. I jump off of plan B. And I get on plan A. And it's your plan. I give my life to you. And I'm not going to turn back. I'm burning those bridges. I'm burning that way of life. And I'm accepting you with all of my heart. I believe. And I know there's no other place. There's no other person but you. And I accept you today. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Come on, can we give God praise in the house? Yeah! Look, for those of you that raised your hand, welcome to a wonderful life. Can I get an amen? And I want to encourage you, if you raise your hand, listen to me. Walk in the waters of baptism. We got leaders that got with you. We love you. We appreciate you. And welcome to the family. Y'all give them one more hand clap, guys. Yeah. God bless you guys. Let's go live this wonderful life that God has given all of us to live. God bless y'all. Thank y'all. Hey, thank you so much for watching. Please like this video. Comment if there's anything on your heart that you would like to share with the community. And be sure to subscribe and turn on your notifications so that you can be alerted every time we upload something new. You be blessed.